And this brings us to phylum Arthropoda. This is the largest animal phylum, and that's primarily because it contains class Insecta, which is your largest animal class. So these guys are your joint-legged animals, and you'll notice that they do have joints in their legs. So phylum Arthropoda, they have jointed appendages, segmentation, and a hard exoskeleton. They do molt, they undergo ectasis. And for respiratory systems, they either have gills, trachea, or book lungs. Book lungs are called such because they look like stacks of books. Just depends on the organism and genus you're looking at. They all have an open circulatory system, so they have a heart that pumps blood, and the blood just sort of bathes all the tissue. It's not kept in blood vessels or veins. It then pools in a certain area and is taken back up by the heart and repumped out so that it washes over everything again. Their blood is called hemolymph. It's similar to ours, but there's some structural differences. And here are our subphylum and classes of arthropoda that we're going to look at. So this is subphylum Trilobitomorphia. So here's what trilobites looked like. Like I said, um, these were fairly common in our early Earth history and predominant throughout our fossil record. Um, and back when we did evolution, if you were at North Lake, this was one of the fossils that we looked at, um, that we had as an example for you guys. More trilobites. And you can see the extensive segmentation. Our next subphylum is Chelicerodia. This is class Arachnidia, your, which includes your spiders, your ticks, and your scorpions. Um, ticks are known for carrying Lyme disease, especially in Texas. We have a lot of ticks. They get on your pets, but also um, on you. If you get bitten by a tick, you need to be on the lookout for the symptoms of Lyme disease. One of the major things about Lyme disease is it causes lockjaw. The muscles in your mouth freeze up and it makes it hard to move um, your mouth and do things like chewing. So characteristics of class arachnidia, they have a cephalothorax, which is a combined head and thorax together. And when we get into insects and some of the others in this phylum, you'll see that they have a separate head and thorax. And then they have an abdomen. So um, spiders and ticks and scorpions tend to just have two body parts, the abdomen and the cephalothorax. They do not have antennae like insects do. They do have trachea or book lungs, and I'll show you what book lungs look in a slide or two. They also have these chelicerae, which are fang-like protrusions from their mouth that are connected to poison glands, allows them to inject their prey with poison. Most spiders aren't poisonous to humans, or at least not deadly poisonous to humans. Um, there are a few that are very poisonous to humans, and we'll look at a few of those. They also have these pedipalps, which are these shortened leg-looking structures here at the front. Um, in male tarantulas, you can tell the sex of the tarantula by the pedipalps. Male pedipalps tend to be very short and rounded, whereas female pedipalps tend to be a little bit skinnier in tarantulas. So now you can tell the difference. Um, they do produce prototenaceous silk in their abdomen. It's created at the body temperature of a spider, so at very low heat, which is something that Marvel scientists, um, we still have not been able to mimic the silk of a spider, and it's much stronger than anything we could build for the um, width that it is. It has a very high tensile strength. If we could build a compound that had the strength of spider silk, it would be stronger than titanium or any metal we've found so far. 
Um, they have four pairs of walking eggs and multiple simple eyes. So here's a look at the two poisonous ones we have here in Texas. You've got your black widow on the left, the underside of the belly of a black widow. It has a red hourglass shape on it. Um, you can find these. They they tend to be in more open areas. They like the tops of trash can lids, things like that. Um, your brown recluse is on the right, and the key characteristic of a brown recluse is they have this fiddle shape on their cephalothorax here um, at the bottom of their head. These guys like very warm, dark areas, so they love storage sheds, love being under cardboard boxes, so be careful anytime you're pulling old boxes out of um, a storage shed. These guys like to hang out underneath them. Their bite actually causes the skin to rot around the bite wound, so not a fun bite to have. It's usually not deadly when treated, um, but it's painful for a long time. My grandfather actually got bit by one of these back before I was even born, but I'm told that it was um, not a fun experience, and he dealt with the rotting skin for several months before it completely healed. So, so here are the two probably most poisonous spiders. Um, they're actually probably tied for it. In the top you have a funnel web spider, which has a very fast acting poison. Um, can take down a human very quickly. And in the bottom you have a the banana spider. The banana spider is probably the more toxic of the two, but in general it doesn't inject enough um, poison into a human to be deadly. So it has to get a large enough dose in even though it is the more toxic. And this here is your common garden spider, very common here in Texas. This is actually one that you want to have around your house. They help keep your insect population under control, so you really do want these guys in your garden. They do tend to get very large, and they build these really large nests. Um, when I was a kid growing up in the country, we had these guys everywhere, and um, in summer when there was no other entertainment about, we would catch grasshoppers and feed them to the spiders to watch them spin them in their silk because they'll actually grab the, um, the grasshopper and completely wrap it in a silk cocoon um, to store it for a snack for later. And it's pretty interesting to watch. And what can I say? Always a scientist at heart, I suppose. Even as a kid, I liked exploring. So here is the anatomy of a spider, and here you can see those book lungs here in the bottom, and they really do look like a stack of books. Um, you can also see, here's the chelis area, the um, spine that they use to inject the poison, and here's the poison gland inside of a spider. They do have a heart, and like I said, it's an open circulatory system. You'll notice that they're lacking any blood vessels, so the heart pumps out the hemolymph, it washes over all of these organs, and then collects back up into the heart and gets repumped. And then down here at the bottom, you have your silk glands that produce that silk, and the spinnerets that spin it into a web, characteristic unique to spiders. So this is the peacock jumping spider. It has a very unique way of attracting mates. It actually performs a little dance for them. And there's a video of that dance in the drop box for you to watch. So this is the death stalker scorpion, probably the most or one of the most poisonous scorpions out there, not native to this region, don't worry. Um, it's characterized by the six stripes on its tail. But even though it's considered one of the most poisonous, Stings from it generally aren't deadly as long as immediate medical attention is sought. Um, there is an antivenom for it. Most of the deaths that happen because of this guy, the individual either had an allergic reaction to the sting, sort of like with bees, bee stings aren't actually deadly unless you have an allergic reaction, um, or the individual already had a medical condition such as a heart condition that the venom aggravated. This is the fat tail scorpion, another one of the most venomous scorpions out there, but even at that, um, there's only a few fatalities every year from this guy. 
And that brings us to subphylum Chelisiformes. This is class Meristomata. These are your horseshoe crabs. They are all marine and they are a very, very ancient group. They've been around for a very long time. Um, they have a hard outer carapace and underneath that carapace they have walking legs and they also have a tail. So here's another look at them. Um, here you can see a person holding them. They can be fairly small um, to fairly large depending on how old they are and what species. Here's a whole bunch of them on the beach. So here's the underside of a horseshoe crab. You've got the tail down here and then you notice you've got walking legs on the underside of their carapace and these walking legs each have pinchers. Um, and you'll also notice on the underside of the carnipus there are barnacles, these guys here. And we'll go over barnacles a little bit later in this lecture. So that brings us to subphylum Myripodia. These are your millipedes and your centipedes. They have a head with antenna and chewing mouth parts. They are both terrestrial. Your centipedes don't actually have a hundred legs necessarily. Some of them might. Um, Instead, they have one pair of legs per segment on their, on their body, whereas millipedes, they don't actually have a thousand, but they do have two pairs of legs per segment. So the actual number will vary by species and by the number of segments of each individual. So here's another look at them. Your centipedes belong to class Chilopodia. Centipedes are very aggressive. They are predators that actively hunt their prey. Whereas millipedes, which is class Diplopodia, are vegetarians, they're her herbivores. They only eat vegetative matter and so they're very docile. Here's another look at the difference between the two. So like I said, Chilopodia, your centipedes have one pair of legs per trunk. They also have trachea and compound eyes. And they have a poisonous front claw on their front trunk, their most anterior trunk segment. And it's actually a modified leg, and it's modified to become what's called a maxilliped. And it's this sharp jabbing structure that they use to stab their prey and overcome it, and it's coated in a poison. It's what allows them to be carnivorous and actively hunt their prey. Diplopodia, your millipedes, like I said, they have two pairs of walking legs per segment. They eat leaves and other organic matter, and these guys are probably among the earliest land animals. They've been around for a very long time, and there are fossil records of them. So here's a look at that first segment in centipedes. It's got your maxilliped with the poisonous fang. These were originally walking legs, and they evolved into this. So it allows them to stab their prey and infect them with the poison and overcome them. There is a video in Dropbox on a centipede actively hunting its prey. Now around here our centipedes tend to be fairly small for the most part. You can find them underneath rocks. You can also find millipedes there. Our millipedes are small. They look like um, really long roly-polies or pill bugs, whatever you called them when you were um, a kid. But centipedes can get to be the size of um, a small snake. Some of them can get to be the size of a medium snake depending on which continent you live on. We do actually have some large ones here in Texas. In fact, I came across one this past summer that was about 8 to 12 inches long and about an inch wide. And um, I was hiking out by the Sulphur River and I steered clear of him. And they move very, very fast. They, um, I thought he was a snake at first until I saw his legs. So I steered clear of him. He was pretty large, pretty impressive. But most of the ones you see around here tend to be fairly small. But they will still sting you. I would never pick up a centipede. Um, millipedes, on the other hand, you can pick up and let them walk all over you since they're herbivores, completely harmless to do so.